Thank you so much, Eli. Today we're talking about family dynamics. And here's the truth about family. We all have one, and nobody got to choose their family. Family just is. So is true for dynamics. Now, if your family is anything like mine, I think we can all agree that there's been at least one moment, maybe two, that we look upon with a little bit of regret, remorse, and possibly just a tinge of shame. Allow me to share one from my own personal childhood. The Hughes family, all five of us, are barreling down the road to an unknown destination in my mom's station wagon, which was no less than 20 feet long. You remember the type, right, with the wood grain sides? And uh, I oftentimes would find myself in the perch in the very back of the station wagon. Those who were under the age of 30 probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but the old time station wagons actually had a seat where you were riding forwards but looking out the window backwards. Does anybody remember having that weird experience? It makes me motion sickness just thinking about it. Typically that's where I would sit so that I would not be uh, a part of any of the drama between my older two brothers. Because if I sat with them, I had to sit in the middle seat, in the middle row of seats. But for whatever reason, that's where I found myself on this fateful night. And we got to fighting. Really and truly, I know you know I'm all perfect. And it really was all my brother's fault. You see, they had this terrible game where one of them would poke me on the shoulder and begin to talk to me. And while I was looking this way, the one behind me would start making faces. But I, I could sense it, right? I mean, it was like a feeling that this person was, was making faces. And I turned my head real, real quickly. And the one that was making faces all of a sudden looked forward like this. And then the other one would poke my shoulder and then he would begin to talk to me. And then the ongoing game would continue to play out until finally I caught one of them making faces at me. And I did the only thing that I knew how to do as the youngest of three boys. I went and hauled off and hit one of them as hard as I possibly could in the shoulder. Now, that caused a big scene. Of course, they hit me back. And um, my dad said these following words. Maybe your dad's ever said them to you. He said, boys, keep fighting, and you're going to find out what. Now, I knew that when my mom said that, it was something that could be taken with a grain of mm, conditioned response because she didn't really mean it until she had said it for about the third or fourth time. But my dad was a man of few words, and so when he said it once, it's all you needed to hear. But for whatever reason, this night, the brothers and I had to tempt fate. So we kept fighting, and we found out what. Now, in what has become known as the Turkey Creek Massacre, <laughs> no, not a Civil War battle, an actual event in which my dad jerked the 20-foot-long station wagon over on the side of the road right at Turkey Creek and proceeded to get out of the car, rip us from the back seat one at a time, and spank us individually until he threw us all back in the back seat of the car, and away we went, all of us, screaming, crying, and snotting. <laughs> I don't know where we finally ended up. The typical MO of the Hughes family was to arrive prim and proper, but this night was anything but. So when we arrived, I'm sure that the other families present were thinking, what in the heck is wrong with this family? We've all got a Turkey Creek massacre somewhere in the story of our family. A moment when the car was jerked over off the side of the road and we expressed, let's just say, less than our best selves. We look back on these things and we think, oh, well, that must be what discipline is. That must be what correction is. And if God is anything like that, I want nothing to do because, listen, my legs are still burning from the night of the Turkey Creek Massacre. But would you believe that that's not 
how God looks at wisdom at all. Through the eyes of wisdom, which is seeing the world through God's perspective, discipline and correction are actually there to keep us on the road as opposed to going off the road. They're there so that we stay out of trouble, not that we find ourselves in trouble. They're there because God is not a vengeful, wrathful God who's out to get us, but believe it or not, God is a heavenly Father who loves us and wants to guide us. So, through God's perspective, one who wants to keep us on the road to wisdom so that every family can fulfill its mission of doing the following two things, loving God with all their hearts, souls, and minds, and loving one another, he puts discipline and correction before us. I believe it's most accurately reflected in Proverbs 15, 32. You just heard Eli Henderson reflect on that. It reads, those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. Now, going back to that road analogy, I envision rumble strips. Has anybody had this occasion where you've either hit the rumble strips to your left or to your right? There's rumble strips that are in the middle of a two-lane road, right there on the double yellow line, so that you don't go into the other lane and have a head-on collision. And there's also rumble strips that are to your immediate right on the white line, so that you don't go off the road and end up in a ditch. Now, any time that I hit the rumble strips, my wife, who is a saint, calmly says, David, dear, you're going off the road. Um, would you mind kindly correcting course and getting back in the center of the lane where the car belongs? Of course that's not what happens. Of course that's not what happens. There's usually an abrupt slam against the door. Her spine stiffens and she says, David, David, David. Is that a pretty good impersonation? <laughs> Such are discipline and correction. They're the rumble strips that keep us on the road. One to our left, one to our right. And the idea is not that we get on the rumble strips and we stay on the rumble strips. Uh, the in-belt seat massage only feels good for so long. The idea is that when God gives us discipline and correction, he wants us to give a course correction so that we will be back on the road, squarely planted to becoming the family who we are called to be, which is a family that loves God and loves one another. So you might be asking, uh, what are the rumble strips that God puts before us? What's to our left? What's to our right? You might be surprised that you've heard yourself either feeling them or saying them. This is how God's discipline and correction works. It's not another rule or regulation to be followed, but in fact, it's something that he puts into your heart, that all quintessential element of wisdom. If you've ever heard yourself saying the following, you've felt the tension of discipline and correction, which, by the way, is not something that parents hand down to children, but it is something that is collectively felt in total as a family organism. See if you've ever heard or felt this within your heart. We haven't seen each other in so long. When's the last time we've done something together as an entire family? Does that land on anyone? How about this? Everyone is just so busy and, and we're all exhausted. How about this last one? We really need to get back into church. These are things that I felt. These are things that I believe that you felt. And I believe that God, through the instrumentation of wisdom, is giving us discipline to our left, correction to our right. So that when we hear these things being said from our heart, they're the equivalent of that rumble strip that's going, we know we need to course correct. And oftentimes, 
The beauty is that the answers are pretty self-explanatory. For example, if you find yourself saying, we haven't seen each other in so long, when's the last time we've done something together as the entire family, the answer might be what? We need to spend time together as a family as a first priority. If you've heard yourself saying, we really need to get back into church, get back into church. That's the beauty of discipline and correction. To your left, to your right, there are voices from your own heart. It's God working through family dynamics to keep you on the road of wisdom so that you can go to the place that God wants you to become. Family that loves God and loves one another. You might be asking, I'm still not convinced though, truly, why discipline and correction? How does it help my family thrive? Well, this same proverb through the message translation, I believe, explains why. Proverbs 15.32 through the message says the same thing in a different way. An undisciplined, self-willed life is puny. (laughs) An obedient, God-willed life is spacious. Turns out that in heeding discipline and correction, your family becomes stronger. And your family operates in more spacious places. I think of it in the following way. Um, When you know what is most important to your family, so much so that you would say, my family will rise and fall on this, and without it, it will not survive, Those are the quintessential things that you are called to focus on by listening through discipline and correction. However, when we don't listen to the discipline and correction, we're going left of center, we're going off the road, very quickly we can find our lives overcrowded with the minutiae of this world. So much so that our family loses its direction and we find ourselves in a mess. So what do we do? I want to contend to you that uh, we allow ourselves to receive the gift of being desperate for what matters most. Now, that point in the sermon did not come into clarity until yesterday. I met an individual of the recovery community here in Carrollton who I had a chance encounter with, and he said something just so beautiful, and I had to just get to know his story a little bit more. And I asked him, I said, sir, how? How is it that here within this recovery community, there is such a family feeling? You're for one another. You're with one another. There's transparency. There's love for God. There's love for one another. And he said the following thing. We have the gift of being desperate. (laughs) We desire to remain sober above all else and are willing to do whatever it takes to remain as such. I I wish that that is a gift that all family dynamics could have and receive. I wish we all had that clarity. The gift of being desperate for that quintessential thing or things that truly is the glue that holds us together. And my contention is the following. I believe we need a teacher to show us what those things are. I believe we need a human embodiment of the voice of correction and discipline so that we keep on the path and we don't go off the road and have our own version of the Turkey Creek Massacre. And and I believe that that voice is Jesus Christ. I believe that it's Jesus because... Listen to what the man said. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He said, come to me all, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I feel like Jesus is the discipline 
and the correction. He's, he's the noise and the nudge. He's the brr of the rumble strip. And he's showing us what is that that is most essential to our family dynamics so that we can stay on the road to becoming the family that loves God and loves one another. And I believe sometimes that discipline and correction hurts a little bit. It hits us in our pride. It causes us to take evaluation and look at things from God's perspective, not our own. So much so that we can say, wow, this is important. And maybe it is even good. It is not holy. And it is not essential. That's wisdom. And that's the voice we invite into our family dynamics so that we stay on that road. But what happens, Pastor? What happens should we leave the road? What happens if we ignore the rumble strips of discipline and correction? What happens if we, if we hear the voice of Jesus but we don't heed it? What happens if even right now we are in the midst of a Turkey Creek massacre, our own family, we're at each other's throats, everybody's crying, everybody's screaming, everybody's snotting, everybody's upset? Well, then you get to call on Jesus in another way, and this is actually the way he most desires to be called out to. Because being a savior, guess what Jesus loves to do? He loves to save us. And in another parable in which I'm paraphrasing from two different gospels, Jesus said in as much, he said, if I were a shepherd and I had 100 sheep, and 99 of them were safely in the pen, but one was lost, it would give me greater joy to go and look and find the one that was lost than just being satisfied with the 99 that were in the pen. Jesus is saying, if your family finds itself in the midst of a Turkey Creek massacre, all you need to do is call out to him. He will come and he will rescue you and he will restore you. He's going to get you back on the road that you need to be on, headed to the place that God desires, which is the family that's becoming one that loves God and loves one another. So I guess the question I have for us is, what are we waiting for? We all got families. Didn't necessarily choose them, but they're ours. And within those dynamics that exist, there is a powerful promise of God. And what are we going to do with the road that's before us? Are we going to heed the discipline and correction? Rumble strips to our left, rumble strips to our right. Not because God is after us, but because God is for us and wants to keep us on the road so that we can become the fulfillment of his heart and we as a family can become whole. And if you're willing... If you're willing to listen to the discipline and correction, I want to invite you to answer these questions, plural, as a family. And they're so important that I want you to write them down. What are you desperate for as a family? What are you desperate for as a family? Remember that gift of desperation? What are you desperate for of a fam as a family? What is your family going to rise or fall on? What are you desperate for as a family? That's the first one. Here's the second one. What can you absolutely not do without? What are you incapable of doing without? What can you absolutely not do without? And here's the promise that I believe within the scripture. The voice of Jesus, discipline and correction, rumble strips, is going to speak through that. And if you lift it up to him in partnership and humble submission, he's going to keep you on the road. Perhaps he's going to get you out of the Turkey Creek massacre of your own family's current existence, and he's going to get you rescued and back on the road. But the promise for you today is that there is hope. There is spacious places before you where you can clearly see this is who we are becoming as a family, and it is good. We're not perfect, and that's not the point. We are becoming a family that loves God and loves one another. 
And if that is your hope and prayer today, I, I want to make this personal invitation. Join a church at First Baptist that wants that for your family. Invest in a church at First Baptist that wants that for your family and has four pastors, deacons, and scores of lay leaders who are deeply committed so that your family would thrive. And call me a liar, but I think you're going to find that in that promise, God is going to show you immeasurably more. Let's consider these things as we now call to prayer in a time of response. Our God, thank you for our families. We're not perfect. We admit that. Oh, how we need discipline and correction. All of us, from children to parents, grandparents. But you're faithful. You put the rumble strips in place. Attune our hearts to be able to listen to them, God. Attune our hearts to be able to learn from Jesus. And whether we're on the road, going off the road, or in a ditch, let us invite him to lead, guide, and direct our families so that we can become the fulfillment of your heart and ours. A family that loves God, a family that loves one another. Amen.